Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. For most of us, it's difficult to imagine living in a world where we aren't all connected, except for maybe the oldest among us and those living far, far removed from civilization, it's probably impossible to remember a time when we weren't connected to the outside world in some fashion. Today we have the internet and cell phones in our pockets. We could, if we so choose, call up someone in Egypt while looking up the latest Japanese fashions and emailing someone in Peru. The news and opinions, the the pulse of the world are at our fingertips. But even before this technological wonderland in which we live, people across the world had access to cable TV and 24-hour news networks and long-distance phone plans and newspapers and radio. Now, my grandmother, she was born in a small town in the Ozark Mountains during the Great Depression. And that's not as far removed as you can get, but it's not tremendously far off. Still, she could turn on a radio and hear the latest news on what was happening in Germany or Japan or North Africa. We have to go fairly far back to find a time when people were truly removed. Even in the era that we concern ourselves with on this show, people correspond with some regularity, and they have a notion of what's happening in the outside world. But all the same, I'd like you to imagine what it was like to be on a small island, halfway around the globe from your home. There's a community there, to be sure, but all around that community is open water, which is controlled by enemy ships. The closest friendly settlement is still days away, and that's with favorable winds. The centers of power, the people who control your life, are, at best, a month away. And that would leave them unable to give any sort of aid to you or your family or your friends should the worst befall your community. If you found yourself in that situation, isolated and feeling threatened, wouldn't you do whatever it took to defend your home? If you imagine that, you begin to understand what it was like to live in Port Royal in the 17th century. Now, when the people of Jamaica were attacked by those Cuban ships, they felt a need to strike back, to arm themselves, and to provide a show of strength to those who were seeking to destroy them. Of course, at the time, they didn't know that their king had just signed a treaty ensuring their safety from those supposed enemies, so they called once again on Admiral Morgan and the Brethren of the Coast to do what they felt needed to be done. That was the situation the citizens of Port Royal and Spanish Town found themselves in. That was their perspective. This is Episode 32, The Royal Perspective. We've talked at some length these past few weeks and months about Henry Morgan and the people of Jamaica, about the circumstances that drove them to do what they did and be who they were, but we've somewhat passed by or overlooked what was happening back in Europe and, more specifically, back in England. So I'd like to take a step back today and look at what was happening in Europe right before Morgan sacked Panama. In early 1669, King Charles II called his brother James and his most trusted advisors into his private chambers. He had deeply important news to impart to them. He told them, with tears in his eyes, of his desire to convert to Catholicism. This was a big deal. Charles was the King of England and Scotland, and England was one of the bulwarks of the Protestant world. Much of England's national identity, even perhaps most of England's national identity, was caught up in their Protestant Anglican church. For their king, who served as the head of their church, well, he just couldn't up and decide one day to become a Catholic. He had duties to his people and and to their church. I mean, okay, look, so after Queen Elizabeth's death, under the first two Stuart monarchs, England rolled back some of their anti-Catholic policies. Now, this upset some people so much that they decided to have a civil war to depose the king and nearly abolished the entire institution of monarchy altogether. Now, in King Charles II's day, with the monarchy restored, the son of the very man who was deposed for being lenient on Catholicism had confessed that he wanted to adopt it for himself. 
That's almost like the king of Saudi Arabia deciding to convert to Shia Islam. It, well, it would disrupt the entire fabric of the society. Is that, I mean, I mean, can they even do that? Is that allowed? Well, King Charles and his advisors weren't sure, but they did know that if he were to do so abruptly, it very well might tear the country apart. You see, the year before, on Easter Sunday, England saw the beginning of what were called the Body House Riots. That's when a few zealous Protestants in the town of Poplar decided to ransack some of the local brothels. They busted up the place, they dragged out some of the patrons, and they gave them a, a stern talking to. The patrons that they chose to drag out were all church officials, or at least powerful known Catholics, and usually that talking to seemed to be parading them around nude and whipping them while reading relevant passages of the Bible. If you're a Game of Thrones fan, that probably sounds pretty familiar, and that's no accident. George R. R. Martin is a fan of history, and pious militant zealots dragging church officials out of brothels is, well, it's powerful imagery. So the body house riots spread from there, and they grew into well-armed bands marching down city streets, carrying whips and weapons and even flags toward the seedy side of town. These bands did the same thing they had done in Poplar, and the movement grew both in size and in its ferocity. Now, it didn't last long. It was broken up pretty quickly by the king, but the king did ask, quote, Why? Why do they go to them then? End quote. You see, he failed to understand just how his people, or at least how some of his people, felt about Catholics in the Catholic Church. Now, that might not match how we in the modern world view Catholicism, but in the late 17th century, a Protestant would see Catholicism as, well, they would see it as lustful, lascivious, sensual, and clearly directly motivated by Lucifer's hand to tempt men back into a false faith. See, while well, Charles had a large number of lovers, both men and women reportedly, but his most prized lovers were given wealth and influence, and even sometimes real power. His favorite mistress was one Lady Castlemaine, and back in 1663, she openly converted to Catholicism. His favorite male lover was openly working in turn in the royal court in favor of Spain and in favor of France. See, this was the English Restoration, and it was, well, well it, almost an answer to the repressed days of Cromwell and the Puritans. Restoration England was fun and fancy and full of sex. And all of that sinful behavior, all that lust and greed and gluttony was, at least in the minds of the Protestants, Catholic behavior. So what do you, a godly English Puritan, do? Clearly, you attack brothels and whip the Catholic men you find them just to show how vile they truly are, naturally. In the end of the Body House Riots, fifteen ringleaders were tried for treason and four of them were executed. But... They weren't wrong, exactly. I mean, rioting and whipping people and even occasionally committing murder, that's not okay. But in the time, Catholicism was very much in vogue in the upper echelons of Restoration England. It was a growing and powerful force. You see, in the past couple of decades, France had made a huge comeback. With the ascension of Louis XIV, they'd left the tumultuous days of religious strife and civil war behind them. Not entirely, not a hundred percent. People were still being terribly persecuted, but things were much more stable under the absolute monarchy of the Sun King. The days in France were awash in sunshine and luncheons in the garden and gossip of court. Their nights were even better. They were filled with parties and elegant balls overflowing with expensive liquor and exotic foods and busty maidens and lusty lads sneaking out into the warm night air to steal a kiss or maybe something more if they were up for it. In the reign of the Sun King, it was great to be French. As, as long as you were rich. It was pretty terrible for the peasants, but who cares about the peasants? Surely they're not going to turn around and bite us, right? But... 
but it was fun to be French. It was fun to be European. Finally, it was fun. Ever since Martin Luther had published that damnable document in Europe, his 95 Theses, Europe had been racked by the storms of religious discord and revolution and war. And finally, things were settling down, and the upper crust of Europe could enjoy the wealth and opulence that their systems of slavery and colonialism had brought them. And their cousins across the Channel in England wanted some of that as well. The streets of London saw women sporting the newest French fashions from the boutiques. More and more nobles were speaking French, probably more than in any time since King William had conquered the island. They ate French food, and they saw French plays, and they read French poets. But as for the king, his connections to France, and more specifically the Catholic Church, went much deeper than the fashions of the day. If you were to think way back to our early episodes on Queen Elizabeth, you might remember a rival claimant to her throne, Mary, Queen of Scots. Well, Mary's full name was Mary Stuart, and she was actually raised in France as a devout Catholic. Most of the Catholics in England considered her to be the rightful queen and Elizabeth the usurper. Now, her first marriage was to the King of France, which made her the queen consort of the nation, but... That husband would die, and after his death she would go on to take up the Scottish throne and marry a Scottish nobleman. King Charles II of England and Scotland was her great-grandson through that marriage. Charles' own mother, Henrietta Maria, was actually French and Catholic. The entire family went into exile in France when it was clear that they were losing their civil war. King Louis took them in and gave them honored places as his court, as he would be expected to do since Henrietta Maria was his aunt and the young king in exile was his cousin. Charles' sister, also named Henrietta like her mother, was baptized originally in the Anglican Church as per her father's wishes, but was converted to Catholicism by her mother as an infant and raised as a Catholic in France. She would go on to marry into the court of King Louis and become the Duchess of Orléans. Upon the restoration of the Stuart monarchy in England, Charles took a bride in 1662. He chose none other than the Infanta Catherine of Portugal. She was the daughter of the Portuguese king and, you guessed it, a Catholic. This upset no small number of English Protestants, but it didn't end there. Catherine, his wife, was forced to take on Charles' favorite lover, into service as one of her ladies of the bedchamber, that same Lady Castlemaine that converted to Catholicism in 1663. Now, Lady Castlemaine was married, as was proper for a young English noblewoman, and she had a number of children. The first of her children was reportedly conceived on the very night that Charles was restored to the throne. Her husband was not the father. She would go on to bear five more illegitimate children of the king's. Charles Fitzroy, Henry Fitzroy, Lady Charlotte Fitzroy, George Fitzroy, and the Lady Barbara Fitzroy. Fitzroy means child of the king. Of course, those weren't the only children of King Charles. He had at least four others that we know of. There was James Fitzroy, whom he had with Lucy Walter, his first known mistress. There was Charles Fitzcharles, whom he had with Catherine Pegg. There was Charles Beauclerk with Nell Gwynne, and then there was Charles Lennox, whom he had with Louis René de Penang. Louis René de Penang. with the Duchess of Portsmouth. Now, that's at least ten children, and not a single one of them was with his own wife. Oh, and then that eldest daughter of Lady Castlemaine and King Charles conceived on the night of his coronation. Well, shortly after being married off at age 13 to a 20-year-old lord, she almost immediately entered into a lesbian relationship with one of her father's own favored mistresses, the then 30-year-old renowned French beauty whom Charles had actually proposed to as a young man in exile in France. Her husband, to break up that relationship, sent her away to his country estates where she was promptly seduced by another lordling. All of this happened by the age of 17. Maybe, just maybe, those tight-knit English Protestants were on to something when they accused these aristocrats of sinful debauchery. Now, none of those names that I just listed off are important to our story. 
except perhaps James Fitzroy, his eldest son, but that will come later on. I just wanted to illustrate how connected King Charles was to the Catholic faith. His great-grandmother was a Catholic. His mother was a Catholic. His sister, Catholic. His wife, Catholic. The woman who he proposed to as a young man and decided to keep on as a lover and the father of one of his children was a Catholic. And his preferred favorite mistress, mother of six of his children, and presumably the woman that he genuinely loved, was a Catholic. Is it any surprise that he would call his brother and closest advisors into his bedchambers to tearfully confess his desire to convert to Catholicism? Well, not to his brother. That year, James, the Duke of York, had taken the Eucharist in France and secretly converted to Catholicism. Now, King Charles knew of his brother's conversion, but they both agreed it would be best, for the time being at least, to keep it a secret. In truth, it was unlikely to be a surprise to either of the other counselors there. Both were confidants of the king, and if they weren't openly sympathetic to the Roman Catholic Church, they were at least aware of the king's sentiment, and they were busy negotiating treaties with France and with Spain. You see, that whole story about the bedchamber is likely just a bunch of malarkey anyway. Charles might have already been a Catholic. He was rumored to have attended Catholic services while in exile, and then taken communion while away in France after being crowned King of England. But it was a necessary piece of propaganda, to attempt to sell the English people on their king's honest and godly conversion while his ministers and close family members were busy negotiating deals to see that England's return to Catholicism went as smoothly as possible. In France, the king's sister, the Duchess de Orléans, Henrietta of England, was busy building bridges between the two monarchs, Louis the Fourteenth and Charles the Second. She would whisper into the Sun King's ear of his cousin's earnest desire to return England to Catholicism, of his love of France and of Louis himself, and his desire to see the rift between the two nations repaired. More and more, King Louis began to see what a favorable turn of events that could be. His rule was still young, and he was having trouble, as usual, with the Dutch Republic on his eastern border. They were growing bold and perhaps even a bit dangerous. There was potential, though, for an alliance between England and France, so he stayed out of war as best as possible, but let Henrietta Maria know of his interest in growing closer with England. So Charles sent two emissaries to France, one Henry Bennett and Sir Thomas Clifford. Now these might have been the two men called into the bedchamber with James and Charles. At the very least, both were Catholic and both were powerful. These were two members of the king's inner council, known as the Cabal, comprised of Baron Clifford, the Earl of Arlington, the Duke of Buckingham, Baron Ashley, and the Duke of Lauderdale, C-A-B-A-L. Now these two sent to France were among those on the cabal that believed in absolute monarchy in the style of Louis the Fourteenth, and in a return to the Catholic Church. Now the treaty that they were there to discuss had already been mostly worked out beforehand between the two monarchs, with Henrietta hammering out some of the details and facilitating the talks, but the two lords had to fine-tune a few things and assign their names. The main points of the treaty described by the French historian François-Auguste Marine Meunier, are as follows. Quote, the King of England will make a public profession of the Catholic faith and will receive the sum of two millions of crowns to aim in his project from the Most Christian King in the course of the next six months. The date of this declaration is left absolutely to his own pleasure. The King of France will faithfully observe the Treaty of A la Chapelle as regards Spain, and the King of England will maintain the Treaty of the Triple Alliance in a similar manner. If new rights to the Spanish monarchy revert to the King of France, the King of England will aid him in maintaining these rights. The two kings will declare war against the United Provinces. The King of France will attack them by land and will receive the help of 6,000 men from England. The King of England will send 50 men of war to sea and the King of France 30. The combined fleets will be under the Duke of York's command. Separate articles will provide for the interests of the Prince of Orange. The Treaty of Commerce, which has already begun, shall be concluded as promptly as possible. End quote. 
Now, this treaty was called the Treaty of Madame, a nod to Henrietta's key role in brokering it. It was ratified in June 1670, though, naturally, it was kept a secret. On August 8th of that same year, negotiations surrounding the Treaty of Madrid concluded as well, bringing peace between Spain and England. Then, another diplomat was sent to France, George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham. He was another member of that cabal, but he was not a Catholic, nor did he approve of absolute monarchy. But he was there to negotiate a treaty with King Louis, outlining an alliance between the two nations and an upcoming potential war with the Dutch Republic. When the Duke began the talks, he was amazed at just how smoothly the negotiations went for him. The French king was open to every suggestion that Villiers put forth, those at least that the king had sent him to acquire. He got Louis to agree to send thirty men of war to sea, and even to observe the treaty of a la chapelle. He hardly had to do any work at all. He said of his time in France that he had, quote, more honors done him than ever were given to any subject, end quote. It was almost like the French king had already agreed to every provision Buckingham put forth, shaken hands on it, and signed his name. King Charles was going to be so happy with Villiers' performance. Now this treaty that the Duke of Buckingham worked out was called the Treaty of Dover, and it was a sham. In almost every way, it was identical to the Treaty of Madame only without that bit at the beginning about the king announcing his conversion to Catholicism and returning England to the church. Now, this Treaty of Dover, it was signed by all five members of the cabal in December of 1670, including those who opposed England becoming more and more Catholic, and including those two whose signatures already graced the first treaty. Charles II along with his brother James, along with Louis the Fourteenth of France, Henrietta, and a host of diplomats on the continent were maneuvering England into a position to renounce the false faith of the Tudors and return to the Catholic fold. It was into this world of wealth and power, of courtly intrigues and of alliances with Spain and France and the Church, with a major war against the Dutch looming, that news came from the other side of the globe. A group of scruffy English and French soldiers, all of them Protestants, had sailed under an English flag and an English admiral. They'd sacked the Catholic cities on Providence and San Lorenzo. They'd attacked the city of Panama, defiled her churches, and burned it to the ground. And worst of all, they'd done this with the official backing of the English governor in Jamaica, who was a representative of the king himself. You see, the structure of power in the early days of the British Empire was pretty straightforward. The king ruled England and all of her colonies. The Lord High Admiral, who was sometimes the king, but it was a shifting position, commanded all of England's navies, and therefore all of her overseas possessions. If he were not the king, he served at the behest of the king. And in 1671, when Morgan attacked Panama, that position was held by James Stuart, the king's brother. Now, under the Lord High Admiral served a council known as the Lords of Trade. They served as a sort of oversight committee over the colonies and the growing East India Company. They were appointed by the Lord High Admiral and also served at the behest of the king. One of their duties, one of their most profitable enterprises, was the appointment of local governors. Now, they chose these governors carefully. They chose men with the right blend of military, commercial, and administrative experience and capability to lead an English colony to success. Or, more typically, they just took huge bribes and promises of a share in the island's profits and named the highest bidder as the governor. Now, these governors were appointed by the Lords of Trade, but they served directly under the Lord High Admiral, and the signature of the king himself appeared on their commissions. These governors had a huge amount of power entrusted to them by the king. Most notable to our story is the power to sign letters of mark, as though that were in the king's name. It was a straight line of responsibility from King Charles II of England down to Governor Modi Ford and his decision to give Henry Morgan permission to attack the Spanish wherever he chose to do so. This was a huge problem for King Charles. He was, in a sense, directly responsible 
for all of the people killed and treasure stolen in Panama. He'd spent years courting the Spanish and only just signed a treaty with them just less than a year ago, and that treaty was already on shaky legs. Now, while he was preparing for a major war with the Netherlands, one of his personal representatives had burned Panama itself to the ground and committed untold atrocities there. Worst of all, Charles had learned of this from the Spanish ambassador. The ambassador was, as you might imagine, quite furious. He told Charles that the queen had fallen to her knees, where she lay in prayer for hours after hearing the news of what had happened to Panama. Now, that was bad, but even worse, learning of it from the ambassador made him look weak. It made him look like he was uninformed and didn't have control of his own lands. It made it look like maybe that treaty that they had just signed was a mistake. If Charles couldn't control his own citizens, then what good was this treaty? The Spanish were very unhappy. It meant nothing if English pirates could still pillage undisturbed. Now, if the Treaty of Madrid fell apart while this war with the Dutch was starting, it would open up his rear to an attack from Spain, who had considerable interest in the Netherlands. Moreover, it might endanger his alliance with France, which was so dear to his heart and so necessary to his plans. So the king took action. First, he immediately sent the architect of the Treaty of Madrid to the Queen Regent herself. William Godolphin had developed a, a rapport with the Queen and with her counselors, with her court, and he was well known there. Then, the king ordered Thomas Modiford, the governor's son, who was in London, arrested and threw him in the Tower of London. This was partly to appease the Spanish as fast as possible, but it was also collateral against the governor of Jamaica, who was a powerful man that had at his beck and call an armada of pirates, led by a very talented admiral, and this governor had a history of going his own way. Then the king had a commission written up waiting for his signature. He named one Sir Thomas Lynch Lieutenant Governor of Jamaica, with the full authority of the Crown backing him. If that name, Thomas Lynch, sounds familiar, well, he'd actually been the Governor of Jamaica once before. He was among that force that initially took the island from the Spanish in 1655, and he'd climbed the ranks up to Lieutenant Governor. For a time, while the colony was without an appointed governor, he'd filled that office. Now, what wasn't written into that commission that the king ordered that was given to Thomas Lynch was a personal order given to him by James, the Lord High Admiral. He was to assess the situation with the pirates there in Port Royal. He was to assess the political climate as well. Then, if the situation allowed, he was to arrest the governor and send him back to England in chains. Lynch was put on board a ship as soon as possible, and they set sail for Jamaica. Now it was with this news, with these tidings, that William Godolphin arrived in Madrid to speak to the Spanish queen. When he was brought before her, he fell to his knees, he kissed at her feet, and he begged her forgiveness. He told of praying for the souls of Panama in company with the king himself, and he told of the sorrow that both he and the king felt for her people. Then he promised her retribution. He told her of the king's swift action to see the offending governor arrested, imprisoned, tried, and perhaps even executed. He promised that he would see justice done in the name of the king. The queen looked at him and brushed that aside. A disobedient governor was a problem, and one which had caused her some trouble, but his removal was necessary housekeeping for any monarch. She wanted something more. Her nation had been scarred by an attack so violent and so evil, and they wouldn't soon recover. It was a black mark upon the reputation of Spain, and the Queen Region knew just at whose feet to lay the blame. She looked at William Godolphin and told him she wanted the head of Henry Morgan. Next time, we'll return to Port Royal with the arrival of Thomas Lynch and the arrival 
of Captain Morgan. I'd like to thank everybody for listening, and thank you for your support. Everybody who has been kind enough to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to the show, everybody who has donated to the show through the website, and everybody who has joined up to support us on Patreon, I really couldn't do this show without you, and I appreciate it. I love doing this, and I'm so glad that you guys find value in it. I've had a boom of support over at Patreon, so I decided it might be good to thank all of our new Patreon supporters, including Alex, Mitch, Grand Adventure, Emily, Eric, Kelly, another Mitch, Patrick, Paul, and Karen Roman. Karen is going to be our ship's linguist and help me with some of my pronunciation. I'd like to thank her and apologize to any of our listeners who are native speakers of Spanish, French, Dutch, any of the Caribbean dialects, or any other language that I managed to butcher on this show. Even our friends across the pond who speak a purer form of English, hopefully we'll get better at that in the near future. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. Brillig is a band out of Australia, and very soon we're going to be venturing to Australia as well with a very peculiar pirate. You can always check them out if you haven't already over at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com, or you can check us out on Facebook, SoundCloud, Twitter, or YouTube. Once again, most importantly, and as always, thank you for listening.